Welcome back to Indianomics. I have been speaking with uh, Marcus Rodlower, the Deputy Director and Chief of Mission of China at IMF, and Dr. Ishwar Prasad, Professor of Economics and an acclaimed China expert. Uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, let me come to the banking piece now. Uh, China, uh, China's banking system and non-banking system, we understand, are already reeling under a lot of bad loans. If Chinese conglomerates were to cut capacity, can the banking system weather the storm? So certainly, this is one area where there is a commonality between India and China. Unless the bad loan problem is tackled frontally in both countries, I think the banking systems are not going to be able to provide the efficient financial intermediation that the countries uh, um, really need. Um, in China, interestingly, in the last uh, um, a few weeks, in fact, as yesterday, there was a proposal uh, to start thinking about taking some of these uh, loans and convert them into assets. Essentially, it's a form of securitizing um, the loans so that they um, are represented at uh, uh, something closer to market value on the books of the banks. Um, but ultimately, this um, uh, is just a reordering um, of the uh, loans. It doesn't tackle the fundamental problem. So. The fundamental issue is trying to get the state enterprises uh, uh, facing harder budget constraints and then almost certainly there is going to have to be a recapitalization of the banking system. Um, estimates of the non-performing uh, loan ratio in China very substantially. The official number which the authorities themselves concede is probably far from accurate mm -hmm. is 2% of uh, loans made by the Chinese banking system are non-performing. That is unlikely to be paid off. But then if you add in what are called special mention loans mm -hmm. that include loans that have a low probability of being paid off and then other loans where the banks have been rolling over the loans to keep them going. The number could be higher and some analyst estimates have gone all the way up to about 20 to 25 percent of uh, assets. Now of course when these assets are sold and some of the loans are partially paid off you may get some recovery but there could still be a fairly significant um, uh, fiscal cost perhaps um, as high as 15 to 20 percent of GDP but um, it's unlikely that this will result in, a, in an explosive sort of crisis um, that we saw in the Western economies in 2008-2009 because fortunately um, the Chinese government owns most of the borrowers and most of the lenders so this won't lead to this sort of liquidity crisis that creates these big financial panics mm -hmm. so there will have to be a big price to be paid and the question is whether the government in the next couple of years gets the SOEs and the financial system moving in the right direction so that they can then bite the bullet take the cost which is going to be significant but at least have the economy and the financial system and the SOEs moving in the right direction by that time. Okay. Well, the problem certainly looks familiar for, for Indian years but perhaps the executive bandwidth, the government bandwidth to tackle it is different. In India, of course, we, ex we are hoping the market will provide some of the answers. Uh, well, uh, uh, Dr. Rodlaw, uh, finally the, uh, the uh, renminbi itself. Uh, it is very clear that China is actually doing a service to the world by not allowing a rapid depreciation of the renminbi, uh, uh, you know, that uh, they would only be in tune with market principles if they allowed it. But do you think they will at some point in 2016 resort to it? One big leap to adjust the renminbi to its correct market value. One big depreciation. Is that a possible strategy? Uh, you know, uh, it is very uh, important uh, as an international organization like the IMF, as a government, and even as a private commentary, not to make uh, speculative comments about exchange rates. And that applies for the renminbi just as well. But what I can say is this. Last year, when we made an assessment of the renminbi in our Article 4 consultation in the middle of last year, mm -hmm. we came to the conclusion that the renminbi is about at the right value from its economic uh, background, China, relative to the rest of the world. You look at the current account balance, you looked at reserves, so we felt last year and after some very deep uh, analysis that the renminbi was appropriately valued. If you look at what has happened since, as I said before, this is a big transition of the economy in real terms and in financial terms and some bumps and some volatility is, about, is bound to happen. But if you look at the value of the renminbi from last year, it has, it has kept more or less its value relative to all the currencies in the world not just one currency, not just a dollar. 
The dollar, of course, has appreciated, and the dollar may go in different directions going forward. But China is looking at the renminbi value versus all its currencies that it's trading with. And if you compare it on that value, on that level, the renminbi hasn't changed very much in effective terms, as we say. So we are going to go through the exercise again in the coming months, again looking at assessing the renminbi. But my expectations would be that our assessment hasn't changed very much. So what China is doing at this point is keeping the renminbi about stable in effective terms relative to a basket of currencies we believe is a good strategy and has a very good chance of success. Okay. Well, uh, a final question to you, Dr. Prasad. What's your sense? Will it be a slow depreciation of the renminbi that we should prepare for uh, the, wor the world outside China? Fortunately, unlike Dr. Odlor, I don't hold an important official position so I can speak uh, more freely. But he has it absolutely right in one sense that um, it's not obvious based on economic fundamentals that the renminbi needs to depreciate uh, very substantially. But markets do have a mind of their own and there seems to be a sense out there in financial markets that the renminbi has nowhere to go but down, that there is a lot of capital uh, outflows and also capital flight that is going to put, uh, push the currency down. Uh, the Chinese don't operate in uh, terms of big moves. They like everything to be gradual. And it is sort of ironic also that the world is now asking China not to do mm. what the world had been asking China to do for a long time, which is let the currency's value be determined by the market. I think over the longer term, this is the only viable strategy to have the currency's value be determined by the market. Um, but in the uh, next few months, I don't think we will see very much action. I think um, as um, Dr. Dr. Rodlau pointed out what we will see is the Chinese trying to maintain a stable value relative to this um, basket of currencies. The complication for the Chinese arises if the dollar were to strengthen very significantly against uh, the euro and the yen. Um, the ECB acted yesterday and the Bank of Japan is likely to uh, act aggressively again. If the dollar strengthens and despite I think what uh, the PBC is trying to do in terms of sending the message that it should be this value of the renminbi against all currencies that matters. Everybody inside and outside China seems to focus on the RMB dollar rate. So that could cause some complications, but I think they will hold the line um, and not let very much happen in terms of even the RMB dollar rate until the fall, because we do have the G20 leaders meeting in early September, and then on October 1, 2016, the RMB will enter the IMF SDR basket, and I think they want to do it on a high note. But if you reach the end of the year and China is continuing to hemorrhage reserves at the rate of about $100 billion a month, so the reserves are coming down to the $2 trillion mark, mm. then things could get a bit interesting. Okay, that sounds a little, uh, not interesting, but scary. But uh, let's wait and see how things pan out. Uh, uh, Dr. Prasad, Dr. Rod Lauer, thank you very much for a most enlightening conversation. Well, key takeaways from our experts. One, China has the fiscal space both to produce a 6.5% growth and yet manage to cut overcapacity in many state enterprises. That's positive. Two, uh, Dr. Odlauer says they can bring down their glut, their oversupply by 10 to 15% in several industries like steel and coal, but 10 to 15% is not much. Uh, as Indians, let us remember that we are still going to be faced with dumping by China in several industries like steel. Third, banking is a mess. The uh, uh, bad loans in the banking space and in the non-banking space is sizable. But since China owns both the defaulter companies and the banks, China will be able to manage perhaps uh, without casting any shadows on the global economy or global markets. The place where there is problem is in the renminbi. Both our experts said that China will attempt a slow depreciation and not a one-time big depreciation. But... Uh, as Dr. Prasad pointed out, if the reserves were to come down to something like $2 trillion, uh, there can be dislocations for the global economy. That's a scary picture. Well, let's wait and see. Thank you for joining me on this edition of Indianomics.